Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Q2 Earnings Call and February Sales Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. And to ask a question during the session, you will need to press star then the number one on your telephone. If you require any further assistance, please press star zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Mr. Richard Galanti, CFO. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Rochelle, and good morning to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone. I'll start by stating that these discussions will include forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Uh, these statements involve risks and uncertainties that may cause actual events, results, and or performance to differ materially from those indicated by such statements. The risks and uncertainties include but are not limited to those outlined in today's call, as well as other risks identified from time to time in the company's public statements and reports filed with the SEC. Uh, Forward-looking statements speak only as of the date they are made, and the company does not undertake to update these statements except as required by law. Uh, in today's press release, we reported operating results for the second quarter of fiscal 2020. The 12 weeks ended this past Feb uh, February 16th, as well as February retail sales results for the four weeks ended this past Sunday, March 1st. Reported net income for the quarter came in at $931 million, or $2.10 per share. This compared to last year's second quarter of $889 million, or $2.01 per share. Net sales for the quarter came in at $38.26 billion, a 10.5% increase over the $34.63 billion I realized last year in the quarter. Comparable sales for the second quarter were as follows. In the U.S., for the 12 weeks on a reported basis, 9.1%. Excluding gas inflation and the impacts of FX, 8.1%. Canada, on a reported basis, 8.9%. X gas and FX, 6.8%. Other international, 7.9% reported and 7.1% X gas and FX. For total company, a reported 8.9% same store sales increase and X gas and FX, a 7.9. Uh, both of those numbers uh, were, were positively impacted as well by approximately a half a percent due to the Thanksgiving uh, holidays occurring one week later this year than last year. Uh, on e-commerce, we reported a 28.4% comp for the 12 weeks, X uh, uh, and a 28% uh, uh, FX. And again, there's a bigger impact of this Thanksgiving holiday shift there, given the importance of that to e-commerce. E-commerce sales in the quarter were positively impacted by an estimated 11 percentage points, and hence the 28% comp result. In terms of second quarter comp sales metrics, second quarter traffic or shopping frequency increased 5.9% worldwide and 6.1% in the U.S. Strengthening foreign currencies relative to the dollar, the U.S. dollar, positively impacted sales by about a quarter of a percent, I'm sorry, by, by about 25 basis points. And gasoline price inflation positively impacted these numbers by about 80 basis points. Our average transaction or size or ticket was up 2.9% during the quarter, which includes the positive impacts of gas inflation and FX. Uh, later in the call, I'll review our, our February sales results. Moving down the income statement for the second quarter, membership in income came in at $816 million, or 6.3% higher than the $768 million recorded in Q2 of last year for a $48 million increase. That percent increase is about the same as it was Q1 year over year. In Q1, we, opened three op we had three new openings. In Q2, we had uh, no new openings. In terms of renewal rates, at Q2 end, our U.S. and Canada renewal rates uh, were, came in at 90.9% and worldwide renewal rate at 88.4%. These are the same levels of renewal that we've achieved in each of the last two fiscal quarters. In terms of number of members at second quarter end, in terms of member households and total cardholders, uh, at the end of second quarter, we had uh, 55.3 million uh, member households up about 600,000 from the 54.7 12 weeks earlier. And total cardholders uh, totaled uh, 100.9 million, up about a million from the 99.9 million we reported at the end of the first quarter. At Q2 end, paid executive memberships stood at 21.7 million members, an increase of 321,000 during the 12 weeks, or about 27,000 per week increase since Q1 end. 
Going down to, to the gross margin line, our reported gross margin in the second quarter was lower year over year by 31 basis points, coming in at 10.98% uh, compared to 11.29% a year ago. That 30 way, that 31 basis point reduction, year, lower number year over year, excluding gas inflation, it would have been 22 basis points lower. Uh, if you'll please jot down the five uh, four line items and two columns, as we usually do. Uh, first column is reported for the second quarter, and the second would be without gas inflation. Uh, the core merchandise margin was down on a reported basis, 30 basis points year over year in the quarter. X gas inflation was down 22. Ancillary businesses, a minus 5 and a minus 2 basis points. 2% 2 reward, plus 4 and plus 2. And then total, as I mentioned, uh, 31 basis points lower year over year on a reported basis, and X gas inflation, 22 basis points lower. The majority of the lower year over year core margin was driven by higher sales penetration of two significant lower margin segments of our operations, uh, which are growing at a faster rate than the core, notably gasoline and e-com, uh, as well as the startup losses at our new poultry complex, which I had mentioned in the first quarter as well. Uh, looking at the core merchandise categories in relation to, o to only their own to, to their own sales, uh, core and core, if you will, margins year over year were lower on a reported basis by 15 basis points, of which six basis points related to the losses from the new poultry complex. Within the core gross margin year over year in Q2, we showed a gross margin increase in soft lines. Uh, food and sundries was about even over year over year, and decreases in both hard lines and fresh foods. Hard lines was down in the quarter primarily due to holiday timing, which shifted more promotional activity into Q2 uh, this year. Fresh was negatively impacted by our step up in price investments uh, versus last year in fresh and fresh, and by the margin impact from the new poultry complex, as I had just mentioned. Uh, we're now halfway through our first year of operations of the poultry facility, which opened on September 10th, and we would expect the gross margin headwinds to decline, uh, but continue, but to decline a little bit as we get to full production capacity and improve operations. Uh, ancillary and other business gross margins on a reported basis, minus five basis points year over year, and minus two X gas deflation in the quarter. Uh, basically, you had a few things that hurt you and a few things that helped you, but overall, minus two X gas inflation. 2% uh, reward was better by four on a reported basis and by two basis points X gas inflation. This relates primarily to a true up of our breakage estimate of the executive member rewards. Moving to SG&A, our reported SG&A percentage year over year was lower or better by 22 basis points, coming in at 9.78% of sales, down from a 10.0 a year earlier. Without gas inflation, SG&A was lower by 13 basis points. Again, if you jot down the following uh, few numbers, four line items in the two columns. Uh, operation, core operations, uh, year over year in Q2 on a reported basis showed an improvement. Uh, or it was lower, so I'll say a plus 17 basis points. And X gas inflation, plus 10. Central, plus 1 and plus 0. Stock compensation was lower, or, or plus 4 and plus 3 on X gas inflation. And again, the total on a reported basis, uh, SG&A was lower by 22 basis points, plus 22, and without gas inflation, a plus 13, so lower uh, by 13. Uh, the core operations component, again, 17 reported, 10 excluding impact from gas. This figure includes the impact of the wage increases that occurred last March of 19. This hit our year-over-year -year comparison by an estimated 3 to 4 basis points. We anniversary that increase just this past week, so the impact in Q3 will be minimal. Uh, SG&A also benefited during Q2 year over year uh, from the shift of sales penetration to lower SG&A, if you will, lower SG&A segments of our operations, which are growing at a faster rate than the core. Again, gas and, uh, and e-com. Central was lower uh, within SG&A. Central was lower on a reported basis by one basis point or flat year over year X gas inflation. We continue to invest and spend in IT to the tune of about five basis points higher year over year. Uh, that it was offset by improvement in other expense items and, of course, helped by strong sales. And stock comp, as I mentioned, uh, on an X gas inflation improvement of three basis points. This varies quarter to quarter. Looking at the last couple of years, generally it's a small hit in Q1 and flat to a small benefit in the other quarters. Nothing really unusual to, port, to report there. Next on the income statement is pre-opening expense. Uh, Pre-opening expense was lower. It came in at $7 million compared to $2 million in Q2 a year ago. 
As I mentioned earlier, this year we had no openings. Last year we had uh, two openings, uh, both in the U.S., one net new opening and one reload. This year's uh, Q2 pre-opening expense uh, in this quarter relates primarily to warehouses that will open during the third and fourth fiscal quarters. Uh, coming up very soon, uh, our uh, uh, opening in Perth, Australia, and also our first in the state of Mississippi, in Ridgeland, Mississippi. That will be our 45th state of up with, uh, where we operate. Those will both open during the next couple of weeks. All told, reported operating income in the second quarter of 2020 increased by 5.2%, coming in at $1,266,000,000 this year, compared to $1,203,000,000 a year ago. Uh, below the operating income line, interest expense was the same year over year, coming in both quarters at $34 million, and interest income and other for the quarter was lower by a million dollars, so almost flat year over year. Overall pre-tax income was up 5.1%, coming in at one billion two seventy seven compared to last year's $1,215,000,000. In terms of income taxes, our rate was just slightly higher year over year. In the second quarter, it, was, it came in at a 25.9% rate compared to 25.8% in Q2 last year. For all, the, for all of fiscal 2020, based on our current estimates, which, of course, are subject to change, we anticipate that our effective normalized total company tax rate to be approximately 26 to 26.5%. Uh, in terms of openings, as I mentioned, uh, we had no openings in, Q, in Q2. We plan two net new openings in Q3, and a, I'll give you a range for Q4, which is our 16-week fiscal quarter, uh, of 11 to 13. Uh, part of that, uh, again, most of the openings concentrated in our fourth fiscal quarter, and of course there's probably a few subject to slipping into early part of next year uh, based on weather. As of Q2N, total warehouse square footage stood at 114 million square feet. In terms of capital expenditures, during the quarter we spent approximately $545 million, and our estimated capex for all of fiscal 20 remains right around $3 billion. In terms of e-commerce, as again, we reported a 28.4% uh, comp sales increase uh, and uh, 28 without FX. Uh, again, a lot of that had to do, a lot of that increase had to do with the Thanksgiving shift. We estimated again that about 11 percentage points of that related to Thanksgiving falling a week later this year and helping this number. Overall, um, uh, a few of the stronger departments, majors, special order kiosk items, seasonal and toys and housewares, uh, these departments generally benefited uh, from the holiday shift. Uh, in terms of total online grocery, that continues to grow at a, at a faster rate than the story comp, comp both today and Instacart, uh, the latter of which isn't included in our e-commerce numbers since they come into the warehouse to buy. Although the sales penetration is still very small, uh, the sales are quite large in the high double-digit range year over year. During the second quarter, we successfully launched both our Japan e-commerce site in December and our Australia e-commerce site uh, this past month in February. And uh, not to be outdone, we recently sold another high-value large carat diamond for a little over $600,000. If anyone's interested, please give me a call. Turning to our February sales results, the four weeks ended this past Sunday, March 1st, compared to the same period last year. As reported uh, in our release, net sales for the month of February came in at $12.2 billion, a 13.8% increase from $10.72 billion a year ago. Uh, in terms of geography, U.S., Reported comp for the four weeks, 12.4%. X gas and FX, 11.6. Canada reported at 10.2. X gas and FX at 10.4. Other international at 12.5. X gas and FX at 13.5. So total company at 12.1 reported and 11.7 X gas and FX. Uh, Ecom for the, uh, for the uh, four week period, 22.6% for the reported and 22.7 uh, X uh, FX. Our February results benefited uh, uh, by last week's big uptick in sales, the fourth week of last month, mostly we believe related to concerns uh, around the coronavirus. This positively impacted the month's total and comparable sales numbers by approximately three percentage points. Uh, U.S. regions uh, with a strong sales results in February, in February were the Northwest, Texas, and the Midwest. Internationally in local currencies, we saw strong results in Taiwan, Japan, Spain, and Mexico. Uh, for, for the month, foreign currencies year over year relative to the dollar hurt Feb comps, February comps sales in Canada by about 60 basis points. 
it impacted negatively other international by about 110 basis points and total company by about 20 basis points. Cannibalization was about a 10 basis point impact to the U.S., to the minus, 140 basis point minus impact to other international, and 30 basis points overall to the company. Uh, moving to merchandise highlights, uh, the following comparable sales results by category. Food and sundries were positive in the low teens. Strongest departments included foods, frozen foods, sundries, and candy. Hard lines were positive in the high singles. Better performing departments were lawn and garden, health and beauty aids, and tires. Soft lines were up in the mid-single digits. Better performing departments included housewares, domestics, and jewelry. And finally, fresh foods were up in the low double digits. Better performing departments included meat and produce. Within ancillary, uh, pharmacy, gas, and hearing aids had uh, some of the better comp sales increases in February. A gas price inflation, I think I mentioned this, positively impacted total reported comp sales by about 60 basis points. Uh, lastly, our comp traffic or frequency for February was up 9.2% worldwide and 8.9% in the U.S. Now, given the FET impact in week four, where we really saw the big uptick, as I know many did out there, related to the concerns over coronavirus. The first three weeks, within that 9.2 worldwide for four weeks, the first three weeks stood at 7.6%. And again, within the 8.9% U.S. frequency number for the four weeks, within that for the three weeks, it was 6.9%. So still a good showing prior to that. For February, the average transaction was up 2.7%. Uh, now turning to the coronavirus and all the issues and impacts surrounding it, uh, like everyone, we are keeping a close eye on the developments around the coronavirus, including the impact on operations, the health and safety of our members and employees, and, of course, our supply chain. As already discussed, we saw strength in our February traffic and comp sales related to the news and concerns about the virus, most particularly in the last week of the month, and that's continuing in the first few days of this week. Our warehouses have overall remained open, with only a few total days of closures at a couple of locations in Korea. As well, our Shanghai location, there's been some limitations uh, required on the number of people in the facility at, this, at a given time. Uh, members are turning to us for a variety of items associated with preparing for and dealing with the virus, such as shelf-stable dry grocery items, cleaning supplies, uh, Clorox and bleach, water, paper goods, hand sanitizers, sanitizing wipes, disinfectants, health and beauty aids, and even items like water filtration and food storage items. And we're doing our best to stay in stock on these and other items. We're getting deliveries daily, uh, but still not enough given the increased levels of demand on certain key items. It's been a little crazy this past week in terms of outside shopping frequency and sales levels, uh, and not only in the United States. In terms of placing quantity limits on what a member can purchase, we are doing that in some instances. It tends to be at all locations, but may differ regionally based on supply levels. I do want to... Uh, give three big shout-outs. Uh, our buying staffs, both here regionally and abroad, are working in some cases around the clock to procure supplies for both existing suppliers and from other sources where possible. Second, a shout-out to our warehouse employees. These last nine or so days it has been beyond busy. Even with the traffic jams and the parking lots and the long lines and check to check out, they've been absolutely awesome. And anecdotally, we're hearing that daily from members. We hear a few other things occasionally, too. And lastly, our suppliers, both domestically and abroad, uh, we feel our strong long-term relationships are, have, have helped to this crisis. Uh, we've been there for them, and they are certainly there for us now. Uh, overall, in terms of what the coronavirus-related demand items, uh, in terms of that, uh, it's, it's looking better, but not perfect. We'll see what each day brings. At our warehouses, uh, in terms of cleanliness and sanitizing, we have uh, enhanced sanitizing protocols and safety procedures have been implemented at all the locations. Some, some, some examples, wiping down car handles with sanitizing wipes, placing of sanitizing wipes, stands at entrances, also along the fresh line wall at food courts, enhanced procedures at the food courts, patio tables, condiment tables, and dispensers, and pin pads, et cetera, the general things you might expect and that we see in all the recommendations. In terms of supply chain, closures of many manufacturing facilities extended well beyond the typical one-week Chinese New Year holiday, which was the last week in January. In many face cases, factories over there were closed for one to two additional weeks. That's now improving each week. Uh, initially, two to three weeks of factory. So, so initially, there were two to three weeks of factory closures, not one. Then about three weeks ago, uh, and just uh, polling some of the buyers that d deal with the factories, 
they felt there was uh, you know, a rough number of 20 to 25 percent production levels, moving up to 40 and now as high as 60 to 80. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's improving and it still has a little ways to go. In terms of transportation issues, uh, with its Chinese New Year and then a couple of additional closure weeks, there were not only product issues but also trucking and port issues. Uh, these are also abating with port capacity in China improving each day as well. And I say port capacity, it's also the shipping lines that come to the various ports. Domestically, truck capacity is plentiful. However, exporting items, uh, including you know, KS items as well as other U.S. manufactured items to our locations uh, in Asia and Australia, it's been a little bit of a challenge because of some container shortages here, uh, but overall okay, it's just taking a little more work. We're finding other ways to handle any, any potential out-of-stocks by shifting SKUs to alternative items and categories, particularly in the areas of domestic goods, food and sundries, and fresh. And as you might expect, our travel business is impacted uh, due to reduced demand as well as higher than normal cancellations of previously booked trips, particularly as it relates to cruises and international travel. I don't think there's any surprise with that. At this point, it's hard to quantify what the financial impact will be for our future results, to our future results. Again, the first week and a half of this fiscal quarter, it's been, uh, it's, the, la the last week and a half, it's been quite good with the sales, but uh, we'll see what tomorrow brings. Uh, we'll continue to pass that information along, and of course, we do report monthly sales results. Finally, in terms of upcoming releases, we will announce our March sales results for the five weeks ending Sunday, April 5th on Wednesday, April 8th, after the market closes. Uh, with that, I will open it up to Q&A and turn it back over to Rochelle. Thank you. All right, thank you. And as a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star and then the number one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from the line of Simeon Gutman from Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hey, Richard. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Um, my first – good, thank you. First question is on um, the gross margin. I think if we if we take the core on core down 15 and you get rid of the, the, the chicken uh, production cost, you're down 9. Did you say within that what the e-commerce mix shift is and how that compares to prior quarters or to the prior run rate? Uh, no, we, didn't, we weren't that specific, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that that one, particularly that one week where it's is so important to e-commerce on promotional items for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, the weekend, the three days leading up to Thanksgiving. So you do have some lower margin. You, you have some lower margin categories in there to start with, as well as we do a lot more promotional stuff as most retailers do with the, with, the, with that week of Thanksgiving. Okay, so, so this was a little bit unusual given the timing and given just the fourth quarter or the, the holiday period was in that number. Well, and I want to stand corrected if there's a couple of people here just corrected me. The e-com numbers are not in the core on core. Uh, so that would be outside of that. Got it, okay. It's, um, it's, oh, but it's still, it's, still, okay. It's, still the strength, it's still the strength in majors. Right, okay. Um, Got it. And, 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 but broad, broadly speaking, the greater mix of e-com, Richard, is going to depress – well, you're saying it's not in that number, but it's, it's, it's unfavorable to gross margin broadly, though. Is that fair? And, and, and is that because of the mix of products that are being bought or because of the discounts or the markup that you're putting on those items? It's, it's both. Uh, you know, I mean, as we try to build new categories over the last year or so, like apparel, we're given some hot deals out there. If you buy one shirt, it's X. If you buy two, it's a little less per, for delivery or whatever else. So, you know, we're, we're, we're driving that business. And, you know, again, we've talked about, yeah, but the big, the big thing is electronics. Electronics tends to be a low-margin business, uh, not only TVs, but, you know, all the, uh, you know, all the computer and phone things. Got it. Okay. My follow-up is on um, just overall reinvestment, right? Your business is growing at a really high level, high single-digit comps. I'm not sure if you plan for that level. And the core on core in general is doing relatively well. It's not down 20 or 30. Um, and I guess the SG&A that you're spending seems somewhat in, in line, but I, I assume you're not flowing through all the leverage that's coming through this model. And so my question is, 
you know, where are you finding places to reinvest? Again, it doesn't seem like the core on core is getting uh, is going down enough to suggest you're putting it back in price. Um, are you finding other places to spend in SG&A? Well, I would argue that we are putting a lot of it back in price. Keep in mind of all the buckets we talk about historically, from the membership fee income to the tax reform to the change in credit card, those things keep growing uh, and, and, and it allows us to be competitive. And when we see strong sales, I think it encourages us to do more of that. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, is I'm not going to go through 10 different things, but there's lots of things. We're very busy. It's not just the, the five basis points I mentioned in IT. We got a lot going on uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with e-com fulfillment, uh, with the chicken complex, which I mentioned. Um, there's a lot uh, with a CCPA. These are small things, but each of these are various numbers of basis points. You know, CCPA is the Privacy California Privacy Act. Uh, we don't point it out because I'm sure there's something that goes the other way sometimes. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of things going on, and uh, we feel pretty good about where where our expenses are, though we're always going to try to improve them. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Gregory Mellich from Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Hi, thanks. Um, Richard, two things I wanted to follow up. One is uh, on the membership fee income. Could you give us what that is in, in constant currency and also if you're seeing any uh, membership sign-ups in flex, like the way sales and traffic have in the last uh, couple weeks. It's uh, two, million, two million. It's two million even with FX. With Got the it. negative end. Yeah. Once we adjust for that. Got it. And then on the sign-ups, uh, have you seen any change there in the in the rate of sign-ups? You know, I, I, I honestly don't know. I know uh, even if a, a few people, I mean, the, the, the shopping frequency is off the charts the last few days, and uh, and you see it on social media with people, te- you know, sending in pictures. Uh, so I've got to believe there's been a little bit of it, but not enough to move the needle. Got it. And then secondly, it was just on gasoline. Um, what, did you have the average selling price this quarter? And if you had any sort of trends on the gallons, it would be great as well. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. I know that there was, was gas was inflationary, correct? Yes. I think. Oh, that's, that's right. Hold on a minute. Yes, price. In Q2, it was 7.9% inflationary. Inflationary. Right. And that's the average selling price per gallon versus a year ago? Yes. Okay. 275 versus 255. Got it. And then uh, last, let's think of things. I know it's coming. Uh, the balance sheet, uh, very strong, more volatile markets. Uh, how, how should we think about buyback capital structure uh, in the you know, current rate environment and environment of the world? Well, uh, every banker calls us every day to let us know that rates are even lower today. <laughs> <by tomorrow. laughs> Um, but no, no. Look, we we continue to look at it. Uh, we talk about it every board meeting, and uh, all I can tell you is to stay tuned. All right. Thanks. Good luck, guys. Thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Harvers from J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. <clears throat> Thanks. Good evening. So, so a few follow-ups. First, on on March, I mean, you are limiting some of those high-volume items, it does look like you've got some pretty low-end stocks uh, out there. Do you see the potential for, you know, comp risk later this month? Well, we don't know. Um, you know, when people have asked is what happens when people, have, you know, have been bulking up on certain items. And, yes, you know, there's out-of-stocks every day, too. But overall, the numbers are incredible because there's so many people coming in, um, and they're buying other stuff as well. Uh, so, uh you know, I don't know what tomorrow brings. You know, when asked the question, um, you know, are, are people to then go through this this additional purchasing of, of, of water and shelf-stable food items and everything, I guess it depends. Are, they, are some of them putting it in their basements for another day? Uh, are some of it related to the fact that people aren't eating out as much? Um, I think it's a combination of those factors. All we know is is that last week, starting Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, 
which is when a lot of the news went even, uh, you know, went in the U.S. went even further. Uh, we had a huge pickup in traffic, which continued over the weekend and increased and increased the first few days of this even further in the first few days of this month, uh, this week. And so we'll see what tomorrow brings. And yeah. again, on, on the supply side, there's clearly not just at Costco but at other places. You know, you you really can't go in and generally find sanitizing items and, and what have you. And while we're getting shipments daily somewhere in, in the U.S., uh, it, whatever limited amounts we get or, or allocated is gone pretty quickly. Uh, and I, I, I would assume that over the next few weeks or several weeks that will abate, but it depends on what else happens with the virus itself. Yeah, I was at a store on Saturday. I've never – right after the open, I've never seen a line that long, <clears throat> all the way back to dairy. Um the my my follow question is is uh, this might be hard to parse out but I think the big question on investors' minds is how the consumer is going to behave. Obviously, you have the pantry load, but you also sell a lot of general merchandise. You also sell a, a lot of big ticket. So we're able to sort of uh, tease out if you're seeing any pullback relative to trend in the past cup at past week or so. In, in some of the more discretionary and larger ticket categories? You know, what's interesting, I, I'm just looking at some handwritten notes from our, that I spoke to our senior buyers yesterday. You would think things like patio furniture would be impacted because it's a big ticket discretionary items. Uh, the comment was we're selling it extremely well. Now, part of that is is we've got a bunch more people coming in. So maybe it per customer the purchase per customer is down a little, but there's a lot more customers. And uh, so, uh, and and uh, uh, what else? Lawn and Garden is doing well. The buyer's view is that's more weather-related in certain markets. There has TV? been some impact. In, excuse me? Did you say TV? Are we going to say TV? No, I said Lawn and Garden, uh, weather-related. Oh. Uh, and then uh, in some electronics items, while some are strong, there's others like some laptops and some phones where there's been some supply chain issues. But I would say overall, the the initial thought, my initial thought is, is that big ticket discretion items might be negatively impacted right now. To the extent they are, it's been more than offset, at least in these last several days, by uh, by the influx of, of, of shopping frequency. I don't know what that means for tomorrow. We'll have to see. Understood. That's super helpful. And- I'm sure all the media outlets are picking this all up. My 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 other questions, uh, two quick ones. One is, have you expanded the number of SKUs in the MVM? It seems to have picked up uh, over the past couple months, but w- want to get your thoughts there. And then lastly, it looks like you have a new grocery delivery option in the app and on your website, sort of an extended delivery option, not the two-day and not the same day. So sort of what's what's been the strategy there, and is that new or just – you know, a repackaging of something you already had. There generally, there's been no change in MVM items. I mean, if it's up a little or down a little, I think that's random, not planned. Uh, and as it relates to uh, shipping, uh, at least the people in the room with me here are not aware of that. Uh, was it? Okay. Yeah. It must be just the repackaging of something that you already had. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Best of luck. Sure. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Chad Rom from Garden Hats. Keep your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. This is actually John Park on for Chuck. Can you guys provide a little bit of an update on the performance of same day and Costco two day and how that's impacting kind of total spend from these customers that are utilizing it? You know, it's it's still relatively new for us over the last year. Um, overall, it might – my knowledge of this is a couple months old. Uh, it's a slight improvement. You know, the concern, of course, is is they buy more having to deliver in one day and two day, and then they come in less frequently. But how less frequently? And they are coming in a little less frequently, but the sum of the two still is fine. Again, it's too early to tell in our view. Does fine continue or does it change a little bit? Uh, we're still – but keep in mind also, we're, we continue to do a lot of things consciously, even through emails, to get you to come back into the location. With, with certain promotional things that are in-store only. Got it. And then I guess just going back to the coronavirus, I mean, is there any way to kind of indicate whether the margin on these sales are materially different than your traditional shop? Uh, you know, food sundries overall is, you know, 
Yeah, it, it's about in line, I would say, on, on the company averages. Um, All right, perfect. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Karen Shore from Barclays. Your line is open. Hi, thanks so much. Um, a couple questions. You, Richard, you commented on the <clears throat> fresh gross margin decline, and uh, I'm wondering if you could just give a little bit of color on that, and that's obviously <coughs> excluding the poultry. Um, you, you kind of call that a step up in price investments. Yeah, we're just, you know, I mean, at the, at, you know, at the end of the day, our heart is we're merchants, and we're and we try to drive business, and uh, and fresh is an area that also is a frequency driver. So uh, it's more my comment is more anecdotal than some new change in strategy. But not necessarily also uh, comment on the competitive landscape. No, you know that is the, the, the increased level of competition that I've talked about. That goes back a year and a half plus ago. And that that hasn't changed. Okay. And then can you just maybe clarify a little bit on the, um, I guess, the true up of the breakage estimates? Well, exactly. you know, well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a small it's a small amount of basis points. When, uh, you know, we issue a significant amount, you know, you can kind of back into the number yourself of, of what percentage of our sales are to get the 2% reward. And we send out those uh, certificates, and there's always going to be some slippage, notwithstanding the fact that we send out reminders to our members that uh, that you uh, you know you haven't cashed this. At the end of the day, we tend to be we do our best guess to accrue for slippage, and uh, I'd like to think that we tend to be a little conservative, and and therefore when there's a review, it picks up the other way. But at the end of the day, we you know accounting rules say you you do your best guess of what it should be. And then when you re-review it, you adjust that. Okay. And then I just want to switch gears to the Shanghai store, and I think you said you eventually, you'll be opening a second one soon. But many, maybe any thoughts on what you think that the actual annual volumes could and will settle out at for that store, and then any update on the number of members at that store since the last call? And then, I mean, I ask it in the context that, you know, to the – that China is an opportunity, it's not so much about the units, it's actually about the volume per unit. Right. Um, well, it's hard to say because this one is so off the charts. Um, I mean, again, the last few weeks, or the last several weeks, with some limitations on number of members for some of that period of time, it's changed a little bit. But, I mean, that was either our top or second or second largest location in our company uh, for the several weeks leading up to that. And the number of members is again off the charts. You know, nearly five times the company. Okay, and but would we take that same number as and apply that to the total revenue for that box, or how should? We no, that? no, no, no. Because you, 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 you know, you know, given the population of Shanghai, and the, the fact that this thing went. You know, you know, throughout social media, and it was very popular over there. You, 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 you have a, you, you have a somewhat higher uh, renewal rate. We don't know yet because we opened it in August, um, but we know from other com- countries. I'm sorry, lower, lower renewal rate, and uh, and no, and you can't just simply multiply that out. But, but our, but the unit overall is. You know, is you know, again either number one or two. It, up until the last few weeks, with what's going on over there with coronavirus, uh, was uh, in our, one of our top two units. Okay, and then just last question for me. I don't think I've asked this for a while, but do you have any? Are you willing to give an update on what you think or what the where the average ticket is in the U.S. of an of an executive member today versus just the basic membership and how that's trended in the last several years? Because it does seem like the momentum has really continued to, you know, increase yeah. in terms of your share gain. Yeah, look, we, we don't disclose that, but more executive members and more penetration of executive members is good. Uh, more members who have the, in the case of the United States, the co-brand credit card is good. And if they have both an executive and that, it's even better. Um, all those things, I think, are help our, help our sales growth. Okay. 
Okay, next question comes from the line of John Hein Bako from Guggenheim. Your line is open. Richard, the, the price investments you mentioned in, in fresh food, was that uh, actually proactive price investments or more uh, delays in passing through, um, you know, vendor increases? And then uh, where those investments occurred, is that was that more protein as opposed to other categories? Uh, it's it's definitely proactive uh, on our part, um, and uh, I think it, it, it's all of the above. It's it's protein. It's fresh. I mean, it's uh, it's produce. Okay, and then and then if you I mean if you look at the fresh food comp, right? So I, I think you said low double digit, and that, that included uh, the final week, right? So that was the best um, fresh food comp you've had in a while. When, I don't know if you can parse out, maybe you can with, with looking at the final week, uh, how much – was some of that um, coronavirus-related or was a lot of that step up related to the price investments? Who knows? Uh, clearly, week four was different than weeks one, two, and three for everything, just a, just a sheer number of people coming into the warehouse. I, I, I personally believe that given that restaurants probably have been impacted a little bit, the last couple of weeks, uh, they're buying more at supermarkets and more at Costco. Uh, so those things help a little bit as well. And then, and then lastly, when you think about it, I know you said the margin on some of that stuff is sort of, you know, in line with the average. When you think about the, the sort of the cost associated with, you know, restocking and, and dealing with that volume, and you think about, I don't know, an, an EBIT margin uh, tied to that volume, normally the EBIT margin will be, the incremental margin will be a lot higher is, is that less the case here because of uh, the cost uh, required to keep, uh, you know, keep up with that volume? Well, yeah, I think there's a lot of additional things that cost you. I mean, there's there's not a lot of it, but I'm sure there's a little air freight going on. And, and, and I'm sure there's, uh, uh, you know, when you've got a, a, a high cube, high weight, low value item like water, you know, 40 half liters for two ninety nine or something, and you're going through it faster than you could put it on the floor, um, you know, there's more labor and everything else. So, uh, but it's still a, a net positive. I, I, in the scheme of things, I don't know if it helps or hurts the bottom a little bit. Okay. Yeah, and the other thing is, is they're not just coming and getting those five items and leaving. Uh, they're shopping a little bit. Again, I personally was surprised that, that patio furniture is strong. And, and maybe per person it's a little weaker, but there's a lot more persons. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from the line of Mike Baker from Nomura. Your line is open. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, a couple questions. One, um, can you tell us how gas profits were this year versus last year, and, and then remind us, if you could, how much uh, that helped 2Q19 versus 2Q18? I believe – I don't have it in front of me, but I believe last year we said gas helped us relative to the prior year. Uh, it was pretty it was it was it wasn't worth talking about plus or minus either way this year okay. versus last. Got it. Uh, okay, shifting gears, a couple more, if I could. Um, so February, even if you take out the first of all, the 300 base points, can we take that out pro rata across, you know, international in, in the U.S. or is it uh, did it impact one region more than the other? And, and, the, and the real question is, when you strip that out, February was much stronger than, than, than you've been running even so. In other words, I presume the first three weeks were strong. So what do you think is behind that uptick even before you got to week four? It must be that it must be those investments in price. Uh, no, at the end of the day, um, it is generally around the world. I think Korea has been a little less than a little less of that felt a little less of that benefit. But there's been you know there's an there was an outbreak there that had a lot of publicity, and I think there were more people perhaps staying home or, or, or you know not going out. Um, the uh, but when I look at U.S., Canada, and several other countries, all of them had big upticks, um, and in that last you know, the past nine or so days. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the last part of the question? Just why, why do you think weeks one, so weeks one, two, and three were obviously strong as well, because when you take out that 300 basis points, it's, it's still, right. you know, your high single digits. So w what do you think is behind that big uptick? Um, there's probably lots of little things I'd like you know, my mother would say we're good merchants and great stuff at low prices. Um, there's, there's nothing that stands out completely. I'm um, certainly there was not a lot of press out there 
uh, uh, issues around coronavirus, even though it was in the news a little bit. So maybe on a macro basis, there's a little bit of that in there. Uh, uh, I think there, there may have been some weather issues a year ago that may have impacted a little. Uh, but overall, we were in those three weeks, forgetting about week four, which was off the charts, uh, it was, uh, we were feeling pretty good about it that some of the stuff we're doing is working and from a merchandising standpoint and a pricing standpoint. Okay, fair enough. I appreciate the time. Your next question comes from the line of Rupesh Parrot from Oppenheimer. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my questions. And thanks for all the comments on the coronavirus. So I guess, Richard, just going back to your comment here on the supply chain. So as you guys look for, you know, at this point, do you expect any impact on your supply chain related to coronavirus, or is it is it too early to tell for later in the year? Well, I think that, first of all, there has been an impact on it. It's now starting to get a little bit further to normal, uh, you know, back to normal, on regular stuff, on some of the virus-related items that people are buying, like water and, and sanitizing items and paper towels and things like that, that's going to take a little, that's going to take a little bit while longer. When I ask the buyers, they, they're, they're working day to day with suppliers. You've got suppliers that are literally working around the clock to, to, to produce and to ship. Uh, but again, people are coming in and, and buying stuff, if you will, for their basement. <clears throat> And what about, I guess I'd ask you more some of the, you know, other categories like electronics and some of those categories that might, may come from Asia. Just curious if you expect an impact. Well, I, I think I that there have been, a, there, we have seen some a little impact on some laptops and, and some cell phones. Uh, and I think that's related to some of the things that we, that we all read about in the paper, uh, about uh, some shortage, you know, some delays because of some of the component parts. Um, uh, I, um, yeah, I think one thing that that helps us a little is we're able to pivot a little bit. So if there was a shortage or something with one area, we're able to put something else in its place since we sell pretty much everything. Uh, but I, we just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, first order business is to get the supply chains back open and running well. Um, yeah, there's two kinds. Of, there are two kinds of supply chain issues. There's the supply chain issues related to all these very high demand items related to fighting and protecting yourself you know, the waters, the sanitizing, things like that. And then there's just stuff. I mean, you know, everything from furniture to apparel to electronics coming from China. And uh, and on the latter, uh, it seems at least while the, the one week – keep in mind, given the planned Chinese New Year week, there was stuff brought in early, not only by us, but I'm sure others. And so uh, – but then there was two more weeks of closures. So those kind of things over the last three weeks, in terms of talking to our buyers, have, the supply chain has – the manufacturers are now back open. They went from zero, if you will, to 25 to 40 to 50 to 60, 80 percent. And now it's getting to the ports, and uh, and some of those things are also being abated, uh, some of the issues there. So I, my guess is if everything got better tomorrow from a concern standpoint – you still have a few weeks here where it takes time to fill those supply chains. Great. And, and one follow-up question, just just on the holiday season, you guys had a really strong performance, even even with fewer selling days. Um, so just curious if there's any surprises or uh, what do you think contributed to the real strong outperformance? Well, I, I think I, I think we this is that's what we do. I mean, I, I think we've done a great job. You know, we've been helped by, uh, you know, strong big ticket categories like electronics, like patio furniture and lawn garden right now, um, uh, and other hard lines and soft lines areas. Uh, Fresh continues to drive our business. When, when, you know, as you know, when we're asked what are the two or three big factors that drive our business or categories, it's fresh, it's gas, it's executive membership, and, again, utilizing those different buckets, you know, even when sales are good, we want to be aggressive in pricing. And it, when sales are bad, we want to be aggressive, more aggressive in pricing. And when sales are good, we want to be more aggressive in pricing. It, it drives the, it, the top line improvements drive the bottom line. Great. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Scott Ciccarelli from RBC Capital Market. Your line is open. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Um, Richard, you, you talked about uh, expecting margin pressure to moderate a bit from the, the poultry plant ramp, and I know there was an incubation period there. So is that plant actually turning out product at this point, 
And related to that, can you give us an idea of what the incremental benefit uh, you guys are expecting um, once, once you're uh, in full production mode? Well, I think it was mid-September when we when the first chicken went through the plan, if you will. Uh, the plan was that 45 weeks later, there would be approximately 2.2 million birds a week being processed. Uh, and uh, so call it September to August. And so we're a little bit past the halfway mark on that. And I believe in terms of production, we're a little bit past the halfway mark on that. Uh, call it a million birds a week. I, I can be off a little bit on either side. And so a lot of this has to do with the fact that you've got this big facility that is running at well below capacity. Uh, the the amount of impairment to margin related to that in Q2 was less than Q1. We would expect it to be less than in Q3 and, and further. Um, so once we get to full capacity, I think, uh, and then I'm sure there's going to be some operational improvements over the first couple of years as well. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a combination of sourcing, uh, and just simple as supply, and our view is is we can improve if you will, the ultimate cost per bird. But we don't know that yet. We, you know, we spent a little more than we planned, but we also upgraded the facility to uh, to be uh, air chilled instead of water chilled. Uh, it, it truly is a state-of-the-art facility for the U.S. and, and a very high-volume facility. And, and I would say right now things are going as planned in terms of that 45-week cycle. And I would like to think that a year from now, or six months from now, or two more quarters from now, it's not going to be an issue that we really even talk about as it relates to how it impacted margin. Gotcha. I, I appreciate that. I don't think I'll be that wrong. Got it. And then I, I know you obviously had the, the surge in that you know, kind of fourth week, as, as you pointed out, because of the coronavirus. Warehouses are obviously jammed. Everyone kind of sees that. I'm curious if you happen to see an even larger increase from e-com in terms of, like, has there been some sort of, shift in consumer behavior at all, or is all the activity concentrated in warehouses? No. I mean, we saw an increase, but not really. I mean, mind you that, you know, it, it, you know we, we saw, you know, throughout February, we saw some increase on e-commerce. But, you know, again, if people are looking for those, the sense of urgency, I'm going out right now and get it, and, you know, uh, you know things like water and everything. And, and, you know, some of those key items, like peanut butter and crackers and, and the like, we have online as well. And those two, in some regions, you know, there might be in and out of stocks. Got it. All right. Thanks, guys. The next question comes from the line of Judah Palmer from Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Hi. Thanks for, for taking the question. Uh, I was hoping maybe you could help us with uh, – kind of how, how things trended in Korea over the last few weeks. You have exposure there. They're, you know, potentially weeks ahead of, of where the U.S. could be, worst-case scenario, for the virus. So in terms of demand and kind of stock up, and then potentially demand falling off as the virus spread there, any insights there? Well, I think the only insight is, is uh, from what I've read, uh, it is not it is the issue that uh, more people are staying at home and not even going out. Um, whereas even near the, you know, all the publicity that the state of Washington and, 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 and King County is getting uh, with a few of the deaths, um, uh, you know, there are people out and about. There's, there's a little less traffic on the highways, and, uh, but notwithstanding that it's on the highways coming to see us. Got it. Um, and then kind of changing gears, We've seen some stuff about potentially requiring uh, membership in some food courts in the press. Um, anything behind the thought process there? Uh, well, first of all, it's, it's gotten more press than it deserves. Uh, there are, I believe, seven current locations uh, on the West Coast where we – and I believe they are all outdoor locations. And one of the challenges we've had is, is particularly on very busy locations where – People that are non-members just come and eat there every day. Uh, you've got member complaints saying, why are you, you know, I have to pay to come to Costco. And so we, we took, we're testing in seven locations that we are limiting it to members only. Um, okay. You know, it's easy in locations where you have the food court inside, but on in many of the ones in, in, uh, in areas where the weather is generally good, like California, Arizona, and things like that, uh, you have a lot of them that are outside. And so we'll, we'll see. 
But that's, uh, but again, seven locations out of 540 we're testing it at, and uh, and it's gotten a lot of press. Okay, got it. And if I could squeeze in one more, anything on on supply in pharmacy and any any people stocking up there and potentially running out of inventory. Um, uh, this is just a quote from the FDA yesterday. It said, while the FDA and other outlets are reporting disruptions in medical products are possible, at this time, manufacturers are reporting that no specific drugs are experiencing a shortage due to the impact of COVID-19. And talking to our front head of pharmacy yesterday, he said the only thing that we've seen, there's been a little pickup there as well. Let's say somebody has a a, a, a year-long prescription, so four nine, you know, four, a, a prescription plus three 90-day refills for – and they'll come in and they'll want all four of them filled now. And in some cases, even when the, their particular insurance plan doesn't cover it, they're paying cash. They're just hoarding, they're hoarding up on their prescription to make sure we're not running out. But that's more, again, I think part of the same thing you're seeing with paper goods. Uh, but from a, from a supply and availability standpoint, we haven't seen anything yet. Okay. Thanks. Why don't we take two more questions? Okay. Next question comes from the line of Oliver Shen from Colin. Your line is open. Hi, Richard. Uh, regarding the supply chain and what you're seeing, what are your thoughts regarding um, the price increases or potential price increases, whether that be from transportation costs or other, and what, what your buyers uh, think may happen there? Um, and a second question is related to, to e-commerce. Um, you made a lot of progress on your mobile app, just what's ahead for uh, changes to the mobile app and also, more broadly, capital investments um, related to e-com and, and supply chain. Thank you. As it relates to costs, the general view of the buyers is is that we have, I get back to the comment I made earlier about strong relations. Um, to the extent that there's some some raw materials cost increases because of shortages, that's going to rain on everybody. In our view, it rains on us a little less. Um, but, you know, I think we, given the limited number of items we buy and the amount of things, we, the amount of a given item that we buy, you know, our buyers, we feel, know a lot more about the cost structure. Uh, and uh, and so uh, I, I haven't seen any commentary on that internally uh, other than there was one small comment, I can't find it in my mess of papers here, that there may be uh, in some small cases – some raw material increases on some particular item, some some particular raw material for some manufacturing process, but overall there's not been a big issue. Right now, um, you know, the only increase in transportation is on some very limited items where there's been a little bit of air freight. Uh, what we're finding is is that the ports again are getting back at capacity, and and uh, and uh, there's plenty of space, and so that's not been as big an issue. As it relates to uh, an e-com investment, um, there's not a lot I have on my plate to tell you today. We're working on more things related to our app, uh, to, 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 you know, to our membership digital app, and, uh, and we certainly have some things going on on the fulfillment side of e-commerce. Uh, and, you know, we've been focused on getting two more countries open, as I mentioned, in the last quarter. And, uh, no, we think uh, – there are a few other things that we've got going on that I'll be happy to chat with the next time around. Okay. And is buy online, pick up in store going as you like, and do you expect a lot of enhancements ahead to that as customers like it? Well, customers like it, but we we don't like it necessarily. Uh, we're doing buy online, pick up in store for some small items, you know, small high-value items. But we're not at the point where we're looking for members to buy online and come up and pick up their whole grocery basket. Um, yeah. So we're we're trying to figure out our way, and certainly, uh, again, the last nine or so days, notwithstanding, uh, things see, things seem to be working pretty well for us in that regard. Yeah, you know, we continue to work on the, uh, uh, you know, uh, where we've had you know good sales and good strength over the last few years in e-commerce is taking certain big and bulky things out of the warehouse, you know, like white goods and, uh, and and things that are delivered in some cases installed, and so we're, we continue to work on those kind of things as well. And lastly, Richard, with the with the surge in demand and the traffic trends that you've seen, 
Um, how have you managed like this customer and guest satisfaction and also um, labor uh, in your stores, uh, th- those kinds of things we were curious about? How do we measure? How have you managed it and just and tried your best to make sure that um, – that customers are happy, and also um, you have the appropriate labor levels, you know, relative to, to spikes and changes in demand. Well, again, the last week and a half, notwithstanding, because it's been nuts. Um, uh, no, first of all, member comments and basic member renewal rates. I mean, we actually, the operators and all the way up to Craig, see uh, weekly uh, information on comments. Um, you can't imagine how many people call and email uh, when they have something that they're concerned about. And uh, we also measure the, the, the least expected, but the, the positive letters to that effect. Um, on, 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 the, uh, on the operations side, uh, you know, the key is still, well, aside from merchandising, uh, you know, the art of merchandising out there and giving the – the warehouse manager, the assistant managers, and the uh, and the uh, merchandisers, warehouse merchandisers, some leeway. Not, I mean, certainly electronics is when you walk in and there's defensive uh, uh, promotional goods and freshes in the back. But at the end of the day, there is a a, 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 a bit of merchandising uh, that is pushed down to the to the regional and warehouse level, and that's what I think drives our business there. Um, in terms of the front end, managing the front end. Uh, I think we've got, last count, 120 of our 540-ish locations in the U.S. with uh, with self-checkout, and we plan another 100 in the next three months. And uh, so always trying to figure out and measuring the number of, transa- number of, of uh, member transactions uh, through the front end per hour. Great. Thank you. Best regards. Great job. Next question from the line of Peter Benedict from Barrett. Your line is open. Hey, Richard. I'll just two quick ones here to close out. So it looks like the business probably comping in the 20% range there in that last week, and, and certainly the demand is probably even higher than that, just given that you guys are running out towards the end of the day. Oh, wait. How, how do you think about the ability for the club to kind of keep up that pace, with that pace of demand? I mean, if this – if this were to go on for three, four more weeks, do you guys think you've got is the supply chain able to keep up with that level of demand, or are you hitting a point where, you know, you're not, you're just not going to get another delivery tomorrow of pick your category? Yeah. No. Well, I think it's 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 all over the board. Um, you know, yesterday I think there was a couple of either Los Angeles or San Diego San Diego counties that announced a uh, a, high, a heightened level of concern. Um, King County here in Seattle did that a couple of days ago. When that happens, that's another catalyst to push people to go out and get more stuff. Um, uh, I would hope, and look, we would all hope this thing peaks and starts to slow down. Um, it, it depends what happens tomorrow. Um, I, I, we'll, you know, we'll be tired but still working hard, given that half of our uh, – Employees, roughly a little over half of our, of the 90% of employees in our warehouses that are hourly, uh, about a little over half of those 90 are full time and a little under half are part time. Uh, certainly, there are employees that want to work more than part time, and so we've been able to accommodate some additional hours there. Uh, but everybody's a little tired, but that's what you do. Okay, and then my my last question is just on on lawn and garden. You you, you mentioned that a couple of times, and, and, you, and you talked about seasonal. Um, maybe expand on that a little bit. Where where in particular are you seeing um, the strong? I guess it's an early start to spring, but maybe talk a little bit about what uh, what you're seeing on that front. Well, the only thing I mentioned there was is that I when in, in getting ready for today's call, I uh, I had spoken to several of the senior merchants in the different categories, and one thing, I, without even looking at the numbers, I thought is I assume some of the big ticket discretionary items might be a little weaker because people are not running in to get those items. They're running in to get you know, other concerned items. And the fact was, to my surprise, that they said that uh, that certain items like uh, uh, you know patio furniture and lawn and, lawn and garden 
was strong. They felt, and again, it was just their view, that Patty, Lawn and Garden was more related to uh, some of the areas of the country where the weather's turned already. Uh, and But clearly because you got X percent more people coming in every day than normal. No, no, that makes sense. Fair enough. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good afternoon, and we're around to answer any questions. Have a good day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.